Well, good morning and welcome to the Fate of the Earth inaugural symposium. No pressure in that title, huh? Um, we're excited to have so many of you here from around the country and internationally to discuss the future of our planet. My name is David Polson. I uh, am a faculty member at the University's Center for Environmental Journalism. And it's uh, my great pleasure and privilege to introduce to you the man whom all of my students want to work for. Uh, Dennis Dimmick is the environment editor at National Geographic magazine. Uh, his bio is in your program. And I think it'd be really great to get him up here as soon as we can. So Dennis, come on up. <laughs> Hello. Uh, nice to see all of you. It's wonderful to be here. I have to admit that when Tom called me and said that he wanted me to participate in this, it was a conference on the fate of the earth. I was going, oh my gosh, that is a big one to take on. And so I tried to come up with a provocative title for this whole thing. And so I'm going to talk about this new emergent uh, idea of thinking about the planet called the, the Anthropocene. And my question is, could this new age of man be our last? And in, in fact, actually, what I could call this talk just as easily is to call it fate of the earth. It's in our hands. Okay, so it's not just uh, uh, a predestined, uh, everybody in this room, all of us. Uh, uh, especially, I want to talk to you students here because you're going to become the future decision makers, policy makers, voters, and, and, and people who are going to keep society moving on, on, on a pathway. I think it's important to always, I think it's important to help for people to understand who I am. I grew up here in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Yes, Mount Hood was a couple, I could drive a couple miles from our farm and see this. I took this picture in the early 70s. Uh, it was all about snow, it was all about rain. I early on had an early appreciation for what it meant to have amenable weather so that we could grow crops and harvest them successfully. This, this is the house that I was in probably, I was 15 months old at this point. It was a great place to grow up out in the country. Uh, and this is how I earned the money to go to college, bailing hay year after year after year. So I, I, had a close, I had a close relationship with the landscape. I understood what it meant when it didn't rain or it rained too much. And then uh, by the time I was like a sophomore in college, I started getting into photography. This is one of my earliest published pictures. This is my younger brother, Rick. We raised purebred Suffolk sheep. I showed them at the fairs, county fairs, state fairs. And then I moved into my artistic mode as a photographer. This is my <laughs> late Grant Wood American Gothic. This is, in fact, my parents, uh, taken in, in the uh, late 60s. And that was real corn in front of our real barn. So. Let's talk about then, fast forward to the work that I've been very fortunate to have become involved with. And I want to stop here for a moment and show you this cover. It was 10 years ago in this building that I began my public speaking career at the invitation of Dave Paulson and Jim Detchen. And this picture, this cover actually was just about to come out. And so I, I want to thank Jim and, and Dave for launching me on this career. I can only hope that I've gotten better over time. And so what you have here, what I'm going to show here is a series of cover, uh, covers about these issues that we have published. And then I will talk with you about essentially a, a cumulative narrative about all this, global warming, loss of ice, uh, biofuels, 2007, energy conservation on the cover of a magazine, uh, fracking last year, North Dakota, where food begins, soil conservation. I took nine years to do this story. We did a special issue on water in April of 2010, the whole thing devoted to the global freshwater crisis a year-long series in 2011 on world populations, its Im implications and future. Last September, a controversial artistic treatment, but we tried to get people's attention of what happens when all the ice on the planet is gone. And this, nobody's seen this yet, starting next month, the May issue of National Geographic, an eight-month, nine-story series on food security for the planet. What's going to happen? How can, we, how can we feed 9 billion people without also trashing the planet? So let's talk about our planet's story. And this Anthropocene epoch proposed as a geologic uh, idea 
uh, Eugene Stormer from Michigan and Paul Crutzen uh, pr proposed this idea of this recent age of man, this Anthropocene, this new extension to the latest geologic epoch, the Holocene. It's, a, uh, it's defined by our massive impact on the planet where the mark of our presence will endure in the geologic record long after we, after we are gone. And when did it begin? Well, that's up for debate. William Ruderman at Virginia says it probably started uh, about eight or 9,000 years ago when we first started cutting down trees to get bigger fields so that we could uh, farm. Um, Kurtzen thinks that probably it was around the start of the Industrial Revolution when we started uh, mining and burning uh, fossil fuel energy. And then there's also, if you don't think that it started then, for sure it started at the start of the nuclear age because there is a, definitely a geologic mark left from our use of uh, nuclear explosions. So really, in one sense, it's a new way to think about our relationship to our own planet. And as part of that population series, we did a story on this idea, the age of man, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Colbert at The New Yorker wrote the essay. Um, and two months later, I was fortunate to be part of a conference at the Geological Society in London on this very same idea. And Oliver Morton, the brilliant science writer and editor from The Economist, wrote a long piece. I did send the links in for those who are in the classes that this piece that he wrote was a wonderful summation of this idea. And it goes like this, the story of Earth and Sun this is it. This is our place. We first saw it like this in December of 1968 when the NASA astronauts were looking back at us from the moon. It's all solar powered. And everything that we do is dependent upon photosynthesis. Has been, is now, will be. Uh, the sun falling on the plant, planet, uh, allowing green plants to grow, create food material, it's the basis of life, growing grasses that provide the cereal crops that we need to eat. It's been this way since we first started uh, trying to feed ourselves. But now we live in this world of more, more energy. So about 300 years ago, we discovered the genie inside the earth, black rocks that burn. This is a coal seam in Wyoming, and it's this. This thing, this black rock, energy laden, full of carbon, is what powered the modern world today. And we go after it with a vengeance. This is the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. We flatten mountains in West Virginia to get at it. It's what keeps the lights on. And though in recent years, our reliance on it in the US has dropped by about a third because we've discovered uh, hydraulic fracturing and natural gas as a replacement. It is still a dominant energy source worldwide. And since the turn of the century, the global reliance on coal has increased as fast or faster than any other energy source on the planet. This power plant in Georgia is the largest carbon emitter in the United States. It burns about five mile long train load trains of coal every day. And countries like China, they rely on it. China and India, look, we built our, in, we built our nation on this energy source. Other countries want to also have what we have. And so China here, coal-fired power plant, uh, significant environmental impact from it. But it's not just coal, it's oil. This is in the Permian Basin in Texas. This is what an oil field looks like near Odessa, Texas. We have transformed landscapes in our quest to get at energy so that we can keep the lights on and keep the wheels turning. And so once we have energy in place, it also allows us to do things like grow more food. Uh, one of the most significant inventions in human history was the Haber-Bosch process in uh, the early last century that allowed us to figure out how to synthesize nitrogen from the atmosphere for plant food. And it originally was designed as a, to build bombs to kill people. And in fact, as Vaclav Smell has said, it is the igniter of the population bomb itself. Because 40 to 50% of all of us, 40 or to put another way, 
40 to 50 percent of all people on Earth today are alive because of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And it's allowed us to transform landscapes. Agriculture has grown dramatically. We can use energy to pump water out of aquifers and transform dry prairies into fertile landscapes. We can, we have mechanized agriculture that can grow vast amounts of grain to do things like feed cars, feed cattle, and make sugar. Or we put it on boats and we send it to places like China or, and Brazil grows it itself. Everybody wants to live like Americans, and one thing that's happening is that we're all moving up the food chain. We're eating higher on the food chain. And that, what comes with that is also an increased impact on the global environment. So you have more energy, uh, you have more food, and a logical sequel to that is more people. And so it is a world where we're over seven and we're going to nine. And interestingly, in 1900, there were 1 1.6 billion of us. And just 100 years later, watch what happened. We became 6.1. 2013, we were 7.1 and we're projected according to UN. Depends, you know, what happens to the climate, what happens to crops, you never know. I mean, if trends continue, we're nine, gonna be 9.7 billion. That's a lot of mouths to feed. And so if you look here, I was born in 51 and it was two and a half billion. And so that's where we are. So we are on track. I mean, it's not a question of where we are now, it's where are we going and how are we gonna manage all this? So you have more, more mouths to feed, more bowls to fill. You have more people wanting clean, fresh water for drinking and for all of the things that we all take for granted. So along the way, what, what has happened? We've changed landscapes dramatically. We've, we've, we've built gleaming cities. This is in Dubai. We've built our highway systems. We've turned natural landscapes into human landscapes. We build as far as we can. We have cheap energy to take us wherever we want to go. We build instant cities, and we transform often some of our best farmland into urban landscapes. We've changed the waters of the planet. Free flowing rivers. Most of the large rivers have already been dammed. This is the Sacramento, just north of Redding, California. And it's allowed us to do wonderful things like irrigate, to generate electricity, to improve crop production. Here, the Central Valley of California, the salad bowl of the United States. The question is, what's gonna happen? There's hardly any snow to feed this land this year. And if you take a look, our own Colorado rarely ever gets to the, to the Sea of Cortez anymore. This is the Yellow River. When we have too many demands on natural systems, this is what happens. And so then what happens is we also go after the groundwater. This is in the northern plains of India. It looks great, but this is not from surface water. This is mining ancient fossil groundwater. Here, an example of what happens when you divert rivers so that you can do things like grow cotton. This is the Aral Sea over nine years. Diverting water upstream for agricultural operations. So much for natural ecosystems. But more than that, then we've changed the nature of nature itself. The lungs of the planet, the forests, the things that soak up carbon that help keep the carbon cycle in balance are so important. Yet, in our desire to do things like grow more food and feed more people, we burn them down and transform them into other kinds of landscapes. What happens to the, to the, to the wild nature that was part of it? But then I would say, but you know what? We're all here because we have jobs and, and businesses and peop young people here are wanting their own place in the world, just like these guys do. Everybody wants to have a place. And so it's a, it's, it's a hard question to just say, oh, you know, nature good, man bad. We're in it now, we're in the driver's seat. And so this is what happens when you get a rainforest in Borneo that gets turned into a, um, a monoculture landscape for the growing of palm oil. It's a biofuel, but it comes at a cost. 
Is this what we're willing to do to trade? And then with agriculture, what we do is we, we cut down, oops, sorry, we cut down the rainforest and then we, and then we transform these landscapes into productive, into productive landscapes, grow soybeans for, for uh, feeding livestock. Increasingly, that's what we do, but also we're not necessarily the best stewards of these landscapes a world of annual crops actually l only covers these landscapes on average about 40% of the year. And so it's always a huge challenge to try to keep the soil in place. That soil erosion is a big challenge, not to, men not to mention nutrient pollution. This is um, a river that has been polluted with surplus nitrogen runoff. The nitrogen cycle is totally out of whack because we, uh, uh, invented synthetic nitrogen. This is uh, a spring in uh, Florida famous for tourists sealed green growing. The, that used to be clear and clean. Now it's laden with nutrient pollution and so you get all the plants in the cloudiness. So it, what you end up with though is this is, these red dots, these are aquatic dead zones. These are all the downstream indicators of an excess of surface runoff, nitrates, phosphates, all of those tools that we have used to create a very productive landscape to grow more food, uh, have green lawns, urbanized world. So you get this. But also it's not that. We've also basically fished out most of the large fish in the sea. And so now we're turning to aquaculture. We are we are transforming the sea into our image of it. So when you look around, these signals of Anthropocene existence are increasingly everywhere. So we live in a world of more, people, money, things. And what underlies all that? Energy. And so let's talk a bit about energy, whether it's natural gas coming out of Wyoming, or oil coming out of Alberta. This is a boreal forest, and this is what happens to boreal forests when you want to get at oil in uh, the name of either, depending upon how you see it, oil sands or tar sands. Uh, this is one of the largest industrial operations in the world. For the record, Canada is the largest foreign supplier of oil to the United States today. Or here, remember the Gulf of Mexico? 2010, the Macondo well, the blowout, this is what it looks like. Questions are, well, but look, we got to keep the wheels turning, don't we? Got to keep the economy humming. So we live in this world of more impact. It's a world of more in our expanding presence across the planet. And it's, it's been often called the great acceleration, especially in the last half of the last century. Um, this we published as part of the Anthropocene article. This chart, impact equals population times affluence times technology. Paul Ehrlich, Paul, John Holbert and Barry Commoner came up with this idea in the early 70s. And it, what it was really was just a way to visualize the accumulated human impact on the planet. So th what you see there, are that cube down there, that's X times population times affluence times technology. That's what you see from 1950, okay? And I already showed you the population curve from mid-century on. This is 2011, okay? That's what's happened by just using those measures in the last 60 years. So there has been a big, there's been a big acceleration of our presence. Case in point, everything in this house came from oil. But the rub is there's no more planet. There's more of us, there's more of our demands and aspirations, but there's no more planet. And the Ecological Footprint Network a few years ago said, well, but here's the deal. There's one of us, but we live like there's one and a half of us, and if everybody lived like us, we'd need four of, of Earth. So in one sense, it's said that we're drawing down our capital, we're, we're living off our capital, we're not living on the ecological interest. Okay, an interesting measure of that is if you just look at the chemistry of the atmosphere and you start here um, in 1950, uh, uh, Keeling started measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in Hawaii. And what you see here is an ex inexorable rise from about 315 to now nearly 400. Why does that, and the zigzag, just so you know, for those of you who, who 
the zig is actually, it's low every year when the leaves in the northern hemisphere trees come out and then each year in the fall when the leaves fall, the level rises. So you get this in, intra-annual variation, but you keep seeing the levels going up. Well, it's, it's only going up like two or three parts per million a year. That's not very much. Why should that matter? Well, here's the deal with CO2 in the atmosphere. It's what's called a radiative gas. It's like it uh, heat bonds to it. And it's a little bit like adding blankets to your bed. And the world would be uninhabitable if we didn't have it. We would be a frozen ice ball floating through, through space. But because we have CO2 in the atmosphere, it's actually the thing that makes the average temperature of the planet livable. But what we're doing is we're burning all this ancient fossil sunshine, all that carbon that got stored away 400 million years ago, and we're drawing it back out and putting it back in the sky. It's like we're adding more blankets to the bed, and so more radiant energy is coming back to the planet and changing the temperatures of the planet. We have like a fever. But it's not just that. It's also changing the chemistry of the oceans. This, for example, is a vent off of the coast of Italy that emits CO2. What happens when you get more CO2 in the oceans, it turns into carbonic acid, CO3, and it changes the way the chemistry of the planet works. And one of the examples of this is the pteropod, which, or coral reefs, they all have calcium like in our bones. And, and, and the, the shells of the ocean are the bones of the sea. And so what we did in an experiment about three years ago, we tried to simulate what the uh, pH of the ocean would be at the end of the century, and we put a pteropod into it, and 45 days later, its shell was gone. The rub is that when you get more CO2 absorbed in the ocean water, the ability of shelled organisms to form shells declines. And that's what we're seeing, especially in northern latitudes. We're already seeing it on the northwest coast of North America. Let's take a step back. I don't want to go too fast here. I think it's important to take a step back and go, oh, well, but wait a minute. Climate's always changed. What are you guys worried about? Well, okay, let's talk about it. Okay, the uh, climate of the Earth has changed. As the Earth orbit has varied from circular to elliptical on 100,000-year cycles, and also the wobble and the tilt of the Earth has not always stayed the same. And those cycles actually change on about 23,000 and 40,000 year cycles. So all of those things are in play and all of those things have influenced past climate history. How do we know that? Well, people like Lonnie Thompson at Ohio State, uh, ice cores, pulling ice cores out of, of ice caps. Uh, he has them stored in a freezer. We have uh, people who are studying uh, uh, tree rings. Uh, the one on the right is actually stalagmites. That stalagmite came from Missouri that gives a 130,000 year record of prior climate. Uh, seashells, corals, all of these things are what's called paleoclimate. Paleoclimatologists, a fascinating uh, field of study, figuring out how the behavior of the climate was in the past so that we can learn, learn from it for the present. And what we know, we know even further back than 400,000 years, we know that CO2 temperature and sea level all travel together. They're like time travelers through history. And, and an example of that here, this is a map we published in uh, 07. And the, the takeaway here is look at the, the green is sea level, the yellow is temperature, and CO2 is the blue line. And, and you see how the variation in the orbit of the Earth have all influenced that. That has, is how our ice ages have begun and ended over the last 400,000 years, the changing relationship of our Earth to itself and the sun. But if you come in and you look closer, what you see now, CO2 is higher than it's ever been in 400,000 years half a million and more years. And so the question is, you look back and you see, oh, well, CO2's up, sea level goes up, um, uh, temp temperatures go up, sea level goes up because the ice on the planet melts. Well, then the question is, well, here we are, what's gonna happen to, to temperature and sea level? Because prior history tells us that w uh, we have warming embedded in the system. Warming and melting of ice and rising of seas are, are, are in our future. 
Let's take a look at the last 60 years of global temperature. This is from NASA. This is measured temperatures globally, decade by decade, and what it's called is anomaly. It's sort of variance from the norm. And what you see is that the northern hemisphere has warmed quite a lot, especially near the poles. So what does that look like? Well, Greenland, the world's largest island, uh, with enough ice on it to raise seas about, I think it's seven feet, is starting to melt. We're losing, we're losing ice, it's turning to water. We're already seeing this house in the Chesapeake Bay is already gone. We see these kinds of rises happening in coastal environments more and more. Let's talk about other glaciers. Columbia Glacier in Alaska. This is uh, by Jim Baylog, who, we, uh, who started what's called the Extreme Ice Survey, time-lapse studies of glaciers in, around the Northern Hemisphere. This is 2006, this is 2012. Let's talk about one of the most significant geological changes we've seen on the face of the planet in the history of humankind. In 79, we first started using satellites to look at the Arctic ice cap. This is what it looked like in September 15, at the end of summer when all, all the melting is done for the summer. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2012. Half of it was gone. So we're seeing changes, visible, significant changes. You don't s read or see much of this in the news. But this is actually a, p a profound change in the sur surface of the planet. We're only now beginning to try to figure out what impact that change is having on things like weather, cold winters, uh, uh, warm winters, these kinds of things. And the idea of changing weather, we did put on the cover of the magazine in September of 2012 in this idea of what's with the weather. And there are four things that we looked at and, and are important to take away. Air temperature, moisture, extreme rainfall, and heat waves. And what we've seen is that air temperatures have gone up over land and sea since 1970 by about a degree. Also because air is warmer on average, it can hold more moisture. And what we've also seen in the United States in that same period is that we've seen a, an increase in what's called extreme rainfall events. These happen to be rain events that are fall within the top 10% of historical rain events. Uh, but we've also seen an in increase in heat waves. So th those are all sort of data-driven indicators that we're, in fact, the weather is changing. Let's take a look just at the uh, last couple of years, not including this year, but this is fascinating. Remember 2012 when it was probably summer in March around here, right? I was in Minnesota at the, in March and it was 80 degrees. This is last year. So we see this whipsaw. We saw this, we're, we're, cold, we're cold this year in the east, yet this, the west and Alaska are exceedingly warm this year. And just yesterday, the National Snow and Ice Data Center re reported out that the Arctic ice grew to its fifth smallest amount this past winter. We're also seeing changing seasons. So this is, if you're a gardener, this, this matters to you, actually. So the blue, the dark blue, that's cold. Different growing seasons. Let's draw, drop a dot right where we are today. Now watch. We're going to move forward from 1990 to 2006. This area is in a different growing seed region. Uh, spring is coming earlier. Fall is coming later. And it's being, uh, and then when you're trying to figure out where are we going down the line, you look here. This is a study by Diefenbaugh, who was at Stanford. It was in geophysical research letters, the idea being, so based on what we know in the temperature trends and business as usual emission scenarios, where are we going to start seeing see summer hot seasons per decade? And what you see going across from the left to the right, that we're going to start seeing summers that are hotter than we've ever seen because we continue to emit uh, carbon from our, essentially from our fossil fueled economies and that's really the probable cause and it all comes back to the sun solar power photosynthesis yes but not current photosynthesis ancient photosynthesis 400 million year old photosynthesis Sandra Steidengraber, the biologist, has said that our national energy policy is to dig up the fossilized carcasses of 400 million year old plants and animals and light them on fire. That's it. Okay? And we put them on trains and we feed them into, into plants, but guess what? 
the lights are on, and it's a wonderful thing. I'm here today because I flew out here on carbon-fueled airplanes, right? All of us drove here in carbon-fueled cars, and it's like, it's a wonderful thing. But every year, by burning fossil fuels, we release about a million years of photosynthesis, okay? No wonder the, the system is a little bit out of whack. So there's a disconnect as I get toward the end here. This is the illuminated world. This is the electric world. And, and what we don't see there, though, is the part of the world that's not. And it's about a quarter of us, about a quarter of humanity. And those of us who have it, we can build amusement parks with uh, fake Eiffel Towers, and we don't need to worry about uh, buying more air conditioners. If it gets hotter, we'll just buy more air conditioners, build more coal plants. It'll get hotter. We'll buy more air conditioners. It's called what's a, called a positive feedback loop. And if we don't have enough fresh water, we'll just, uh, like here in Dubai, we'll just burn more oil and create d desal water. It's all good, except for those who don't have it. And you, if you don't have water to your home, there's a, a billion and a half people in the world who uh, don't have access to electricity. 40% of us don't have access to cl clean, f fresh water and sanitation. And people are struggling to just get enough to eat. Many just live like it's back in the medieval period. There's a disconnect between the world we live in and the world many do. And we, one thing we need to try to figure out is how to reconcile that. So we're not immune. We're not immune. This uh, pine beetles are killing our forests because the winters are going away. This is Alaska 10 years ago. The same thing's happening in the Rockies and the Cascades now. Fire seasons are longer, fires are more intense. This picture taken just about a week ago shows the snowpack in the, in the low, southern Cascades and the northern Sierra Nevada. California's average snowpack this year was about 32% of normal. That, mean, that has an impact on how much water is going to be there next fall. They don't have a lot. And this, this is where we get a lot of our fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we still want to live like kings, everybody with a swimming pool in their backyard. But we shouldn't forget that the Anasazi had to leave when they ran out of water in the late 1200s. And food security, as I get down to the very end, I need to address it partly because it was one of the most compelling aspects of this recently released uh, international climate uh, summary. <clears throat> this study by uh, Roz Naylor and David Battisti that was published in Science actually almost five years ago now, what it's doing is it's trying to imagine what summers are going to look like in, the, in future decades based on cur current carbon emissions scenarios, our burning of coal, oil, and gas. And what you see here is that uh, in some areas, uh, uh, 90 to 100 percent of summers are going to be hotter than they ever have been. The hottest summer is baseline being used is that 2003 summer in Europe. While you go forward, as long as we keep burning uh, fuel, this is what summers are going to look like. Let's not forget our own summer in 2012 here in the Midwest. When you get heat waves and drought, and especially heat waves, those play hell with crops especially during flowering season with uh, corn. And that, that's something that we have to keep in mind. And so four, uh, four years ago, our own National Academy of Sciences said that impacts of temperature rises are like for every degree centigrade we go up, we lose 10%, up to 10% of our rain, up to 10% of our stream flow and 5 to 15 percent lower crop yields. It's a study like this that was aggregated into the big meta-analysis of the IPCC. This study by David Lobel that was published in Science in 2011, and corn globally is already down 3.8. Wheat's down 5.5. So in one sense, we have more people, we have more desire to have more food, yet Yet because we're seeing warming, the food security question is becoming increasingly urgent. And that's one reason why we're doing a, a series on this. So as we come back and ask ourselves, so what can we do? We need to confront the future, not to put our head in the sand. We need to face up. And we can't continue to live on a path like this. This was the well in the 
Gulf of Mexico. And doing things like putting Band-Aids on the ice to save the ice, though, though uh, nice as a sentimental thought, is not going to solve the problem. You're not dealing with the cause. Or to take the ice where it is and hope that it doesn't all melt before you get to where you need to go, that's also nice try, but it doesn't deal with the basic underlying changes needed. So what we really need to do is rethink our approach. And I come back here to this blue planet, our whole Earth. And so I would submit to you that whole Earth, it's green. It's our environment. And within that is society. And within that is economy. It's not economy versus environment. The economy, as Gaylord Nelson said, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment not the other way around. With no environment, there will be no economy. Three things I leave you with, three things. Educate girls. If there's one thing that you can do to help influence global change, it is to get girls across the world in school educated. When, they, when they're smart, they make their own decisions about reproduction. It, uh, the records show time after time, Brazil, Tunisia, elsewhere, if you can do it, fertility rates drop. That is one of the most important things we can do. Okay? Save your forests. They are the thing that you need. Sure, if you want to save the bears and save the wildlife and the tiger, absolutely. But at the same time, you need to save and actually enhance forests because they become, they become one of your biggest sponges for carbon. And the last thing is low carbon energy. And so what I leave you with here is actually a scenario. And it comes back to the sun. And what we're doing now is we're, we're, what we're doing is that we are burning fossil sunshine, right? That 400 million year old sunshine. The question is, can we get back to current? Can we learn lessons from photosynthesis itself to inspire the way we build our future energy? This is Dan Nocera, who spent his whole life trying to figure out how to create what's called an artificial leaf that would allow you to split, use solar energy to split water. He's holding water that would actually power this house and this car for a day uh, using hydrogen. I know there's some reluctance to the idea of hydrogen, but it, uh, when you know that carbon is floating around in the atmosphere, I'm open to all alternatives. So this scenario. Uh, this is from the IPCC third assessment, and, and so bear with me. There's a little bit of a jujitsu and an experiment here, but I think it's useful on two levels. One, it helps you envision what kind of an alternative energy future we would have, and it also, for those of you who are trying to communicate these issues, this is really, to me, it's a real challenge. And I was thinking, how can I, how can I help make this visual for people so they understand? So there you go. There's your current business as usual, the red line. That's where your carbon emissions are, and that's where your sea level is going. And so if you could just clean up your energy and, and lower your carbon emissions, can you keep your uh, CO2 levels to 450 or so when we know we're at 400? So about 10 years ago, uh, Robert Sokolow from Princeton and, and colleague Stephen Pacala published actually an incredibly influential paper in science on this idea of stabilization wedges, the idea that you could limit atmospheric CO2 to a trajectory that avoids a doubling of pre-industrial concentration. So you saw the previous one with the sea levels up, here it's down. And so what the idea is, it's a bit like a pie. What you're trying to do is divide and conquer. There are no silver bullets. There's many different kinds of buckshot you need to apply to solve this problem. It's not just one thing. And you have to keep doing it because we already have high levels. We have to try to bring it down also. So what does this look like? It's like, OK, wedges of a pie. What it means is there's different categories that we could be thinking about as we try to cre continue to produce energy without also producing carbon. All of these, efficiency, low carbon fuel, renewables, renewed forests, capture and store carbon. It means things like better fuel economy, more mass transit, efficient buildings, energy efficient buildings, efficient lights. This one light bulb, when burned, this CFL, when burned in a house for one year, will save you 500, uh, uh, 500 pounds of carbon of coal. Wind power, solar. Uh, biofuels, as long as it's not competing with the food chain. Uh, biodiesel from algae, novel. In, there are lots of opportunities. 
stop cutting force because force itself are the things that soak it up. And you're probably going to have to also try to figure out how you can store carbon. Uh, the current issue, National Geographic has a story on can coal ever be clean, and it tries to confront the question, can we use carbon capture and storage as a, as a useful, scalable means to, to allow us to continue to uh, use coal. Maybe it's geothermal, and yes, maybe it's nuclear. It has its opponents, but tw uh, one out of five kilowatts in this country already come from it. In some countries, it's over 80 percent. It is the only non-carbon emitting power source on the planet today that runs 24-7. So really what it is, it's a combination of choices. It's not just one. So if you come back and you see this, there's the red line. You want to get away from it, and you want to try to get to the yellow. It's all these things working together. And the faster we do it, the, the, the easier it's going to be. All of these things add up might allow you to start flattening that curve of carbon emissions. So here, efficient cars, mass transit, efficient lights, wind, solar, biofuels, forests saved, carbon capture. Will that hold you to 450? Some argue we need to go to 350, 350.org, others. There's work ahead. Sure there is. Uh, as they said in the paper, we do possess the know-how to solve the carbon and climate problem for the next half century. Do we have the will? I would say this, that the fate of the earth is actually, it's in our hands. Thank you. For those of you standing, there are several seats available up toward the front. If you want to come and take a seat, you're welcome to. One more announcement. If you did not get a parking validation, they are available at the registration desk at the end of the session. Thank you. give you a couple little instructions on what's going to go on. Um, we have a couple discussions to react uh, to Dennis's uh, presentation. Uh, we have some questions that have been submitted by the MSU community, uh, students in particular, solicited. We'll bring out a couple of those as well, and then of course we'll open it up to questions uh, from the floor. Um, I want to introduce to you today um, our first uh, discussant, uh, Eric Friedman. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who spent 20 years covering public and legal affairs in Michigan and in New York. Uh, he currently serves as the director of MSU's Knight Center for Environmental Journalism and the director of Capital News Service. He has taught environmental journalism in Uzbekistan as a Fulbright uh, uh, scholar, and he continues to research environmental journalism in the former Soviet republics of Central Asia. Eric? Thank you, everyone. And uh, Dennis, thank you for the best illustrated, most gloomy <laughs> presentation. Um, and I'll come back to the pictures in a moment. Um, as I saw his presentation, which combined images and statistics and science and human faces, which to me is probably the most important way of connecting with these kind of mega problems that we face. There were 
three what themes I saw and a how theme. First, I got a sense of inevitability. And it was everything from the population trend to carbon levels to coal plant. How do we deal with what you call the great acceleration and the fact that it seems like a problem that can't be solved no matter how many of those pluses you put towards the end of the presentation. The second was the theme that began with your very first pictures, the images of landscape and the concept of transformation of landscape. I'm struck when I travel around the world by this continuing urban migration. And it's in wealthy countries, it's in poor countries. People leave the land for economic reasons, for cultural reasons, for family reasons. There was uh, a movie a couple of years ago about the world's greatest migration that happens every year over the Chinese New Year. And literally tens of millions of people who have migrated to cities for jobs go back home. And they go back to homes that have, as they see it, little or no opportunity and that annual migration seems like it's going to be continuing again, part of this great acceleration. And people lose their connection with landscape. The third what question is how we as Americans living here, drinking our coffee, deal with if it's good enough for you, why isn't it good enough for me? The story that Dennis referred to about coal in this month's issue of National Geographic has a graphic that shows the huge surge in demand for coal produced electricity, China and India, and use going down a little in the United States, but going up in some industrialized countries like South Korea, going down in, in some others like Germany. But we expose people around the world to our lifestyle, at least as imagined by movies and television and advertising and corporations that are global. How can you tell people you can't have, you have no right to have what we have? And the fourth is a how question that interests me as a journalist. How we tell these complicated stories how we make those images resonate, how we make the graphics that convey complicated scientific discoveries and speculation comprehensible. Um, we've, who's seen photos lately or video or news accounts of air pollution in China? The public becomes, I think, jaded to that. I think we've become jaded to the strip mining kind of images that Dennis showed. This issue that he referred to uh, has a lot of those images. It also has some great images of miners at illegal coal mining operations working at risk of death to get this black gold, this uh, sunshine that's 400 million years old. And people like the kind of cover. You can't probably see it way back there. The, the cover story this month is Wild Pets. And there's this cute little hedgehoggy kind of critter here on the, on the front cover. It's a great article and it's got great photos. How do you, you can't keep selling images of gloom and doom and expect them to have an impact. So what do we as communicators do to tell that story and keep attention on it? Okay, our uh, second discussant is uh, Steve Running, Professor of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana and Director of the Numerical Terradynamic Simulation Group. A recognized expert in global ecosystem monitoring, Running was invited to serve on the board of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 2007, the IPCC was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their work with man-made climate change and counteracting the climate change. Dr. Running. Uh, thank you. And uh, this is uh, interesting that this week, yet the next, the fifth 
Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2 report was released and uh, what we see is uh, uh, six more years of points added to, to uh, each curve. Uh, I want to start back uh, when I was an undergraduate and I know there's some students here and, and it kind of takes us back to how long the science community has been trying to draw attention to this topic. Uh, in 1972, a book came out called The Limits to Growth. And I'll bet uh, people in the audience with hair my color probably all remember it because uh, back then it was the very first model of uh, the Earth system. And uh, what uh, what is ironic about the, that book, looking backwards now, is it projected with really a very simple model. I mean, our computers at the time were about like the computer in your wristwatch nowadays. And yet it projected that by the first few decades of the 21st century, humanity would have pretty much consumed the planet and we would really have a dramatic uh, uh, downward spiral in, uh, in society. And um, that's 40 years ago that they made that projection. And the economist in particular uh, just trashed it mercilessly for years, just dro drove it into the ground. And um, we've now had uh, you, you use the human footprint analysis. That's uh, a more recent a attempt to look at how much of our, our planet uh, we're consuming and of course what we have left. Uh, yet another uh, framing of this issue uh, has recently emerged, uh, a, a major paper in Nature uh, called Planetary Boundaries. Uh, came out in 2009, just before the big Copenhagen uh, climate summit that we didn't accomplish anything with. And uh, so here again, a new uh, uh, framing of basically the same issue that the limits to growth uh, started. Now, uh, in my own research, I, I write software for NASA satellites and I actually calculate the global plant growth every year, global net primary production. And so uh, I've now done this for 13 years. And um, one of the things after this 13 years of data and cal using some older satellites that I, I noticed a couple years ago was that it seems like terrestrial net primary production uh, is a planetary boundary. It really hasn't changed through this entire green revolution period. My data set shows that uh, the NPP has stayed constant. Now that might be good, at least it isn't going down. But what I see on the other side of the coin is we may have a capacity in this biosphere that we should be paying attention to. Run an analysis that I published in Science about a year ago, I, uh, I came to the conclusion that we only have about 10% of uh, global biospheric primary production remaining that we aren't already co-opting. About 10% left. Um, that kind of sounds like a limits to growth, doesn't it? It sounds like a planetary boundary. Uh, and uh, that seems real. In 30 years, we haven't been able to move this needle more than uh, one or two percent per year uh, fluctuation. What my conclusion of that then is, with the global carbon cycle, that our, our first priority clearly has to be food security, which you did a great job of taking uh, the audience uh, through that issue of we, we have to uh, be feeding about two billion more people by 2050 than we are now. And in addition, we have at least a couple of billion people on earth now that aspire to eat better than they do currently. So we have the potential for nearly doubling the demand for global food supply and what I see is, is uh, 
First, we may have a hard time retaining the global food production that we do now in the face of uh, particularly limited irrigation water supply and uh, the uh, nitrogen pollution uh, that you've seen in uh, this presentation. And what I see is, is the biggest threat to that is uh, if we allow the idea of bioenergy to really go out of control. Because if, uh, if we start going after bioenergy at an industrial scale uh, in agricultural land uh, uh, around the world, uh, that'll be a direct competitor for this food supply that I think will we're going to have a tough time making it to 2050 with adequate food security already without, um, without having uh, a bioenergy uh, competition. So I, I think my final observation uh, as I've looked in the last few years is in the U.S. here, we actually are starting to flatten our emission curve. Our, our CO2 emissions as a nation in the last half dozen years have peaked and are just trying to teeter down. And so I like to think that we're maybe starting to get it as a society. And uh, of course, by far, we now know the biggest uh, carbon emitter is China. And it's easy to just blame them. Uh, and yet that really isn't legitimate at all. And uh, what I see in my travels around uh, with my science uh, colleagues around the world is um, they all ask me, and I mean every, all of them, whenever I go to an international conference, they say, uh, Steve, uh, the U.S. seems to like to lead the world in everything. How come suddenly in the global change issue you want to sit at the back of the bus? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, many things thrown out. Thank you both gentlemen. Uh, I don't think there's much purpose in me trying to respond specifically many questions. I think I would only uh, try to s say this, that uh, this is a conference about the fate of the Europe. So it is necessary to triangulate the tensions at play. And these kinds of um, framings don't get done often in the public mind in this nation. Envi coverage of environmental issues, if there is coverage at all, is probably one of the first beats to go in newsroom budgets that are constrained. The kinds of coverage that draws these connections is we get a lot of play-by-play. Uh, uh, play. Is it Obama's war on coal? Is it not? What about carbon regs? All that. But that really doesn't get to the bigger question. Remember, we live in a global atmosphere. We live in a global environment. What China does, and to follow on what Steve says, remember that they are building many things that we are more than happy to go down to the store and buy. So we are all implicit in this. Um, this to me is a multi-generational challenge. I have two college-age daughters. Um, uh, both of them are um, deeply interested in environmental issues. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, I think that we're not going to solve this problem overnight. We're not going to solve this problem with the people who are currently in positions of decision making. The future belongs to the young people who are now framing their world view and will be the ones who can take the country in new directions. You are the ones I am trying to speak to. There is always the balance between, well, I wouldn't want to be too grave here for fear that everybody will run and hide. 
But we live in a culture where we have no idea where food comes from. We have no idea where energy comes from. All we're really trying to do in these projects that we publish is to draw the lines back to source. I've known Wes Jackson of the Land Institute now for nearly 30 years. And one of the most compelling lessons he's ever taught me is that uh, if you're going to solve for problem, you have to uh, uh, draw the line, the circle of consideration large enough to include causation. The energy question may, is, the, to me, the key question that we have to solve. As long as, as long as the trend lines are showing that the climate system is going to be increasingly disrupted, that's going to affect all other things. Fresh water, food, all of that. The future belongs to those, like, it's like Nocera. What Nocera is trying to do is trying to provide power for people who don't have power and to do it in a way where we're not burning more coal. And that's where we're at, really. If we can make infrastructure investments uh, where we're investing in non-carbon energy, maybe we have a chance. But we have to keep in mind that energy investments are decadal, multi-decadal. When you build a coal plant, that's a 60 to 75 year investment. You have made a capital investment. When you build a pipeline, you have made a capital investment that commits you to a pathway for a very long time. So, and when you do that, there's only so much capital. So if you can, one thing that's happening right now is solar PV is dramatically dropping in price. And there are opportunities, and I think that the future belongs to those who can create the alternate pathway. I, I think we'll go now to a uh, question that was uh, posed by uh, uh, an MSU student, and, and I think it's really posed on behalf of uh, everybody who can't be here today, everybody who is unable to sit through that marvelous series of uh, uh, images that we, we just happen to see. Um, and the question is, how would you propose that people educated on global climate change communicate this issue to the public in such a way that we actually begin to do something and see changes? I think it comes down to being able to paint an alternate picture uh, of the way we uh, uh, generate, use, and generate and, and use energy. That is, that there is a reason the sun shines in the sky. There's a reason, you know, it's morning in America. That was a marketing slogan that had great traction. And I and I think we if we if we can help people envision an alternate future where there are cleaner skies and the climate is stable, it's going to help. Look, there are no easy answers. We've been talking about this thing for how long now? So it really does come back to, part of it also is being able to not be fearful of change. You know, that's a good answer, but I'm going to let you off the hook on that one. <laughs> What is the mechanism for delivering that communication for all those people who cannot sit here for an hour and see your slides? What is the infrastructure that um, we can create or the infrastructure in place that we can use to deliver such a complex yet important message? Or do we throw up our arms and say, everybody read National Geographic this month? And I'd bounce that down to the rest of the panel, too. If have any reaction to that? You two are in the journal. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for new ideas. Yeah, leave me out of this one. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things that to me is the most interesting area now really has very little to do with communicating these specific ideas, but trying to understand why these ideas don't get traction. And what are the things that block people from accepting, um, say, the conclusions of scientific bodies. Has science just become another special interest pleader in the in the society like anybody else who's a drum beater? 
that to me, this role of why there is an increasing distrust of institutions, uh, that to me is an interesting question to try to confront. What is it that gets in the way of people's willingness to, to accept these kinds of ideas? I think part, part, part of it has to do with the fact that people are just trying to get by. And that, that to actually be asked to do something different is we're all struggling. The world is moving fast and, and we're all struggling to try to just keep up. And so it would be great. Wouldn't it be great if somebody just installed a whole new energy system and I could just go over and flip another switch on the wall and it's all be done? I mean, that's, that's part of the challenge that we're facing and people are so overwhelmed. So part of it is how do you meet people where they are and try to figure out what their needs are and could any alternate solutions uh, improve their, their, their world? For example, a friend of mine, actually the photographer Rob Kendrick, who photographed that story on coal, uh, in, in, uh, installed uh, uh, 25,000 watts of solar PV on his, yeah? on his house in Austin, Texas last year and he sells power back to the grid. And it's, it's, it's a, uh, so he is, he's changed the way he uses energy. And, and so it's, it's little things add up. It's not just big things happening all at once. It, it, it is a question of uh, uh, slowly but surely each of us can make small decisions that, uh, that, that do add up. I'll give it a go also. Um, I think part of the answer is, is we as academics have to lead by example for the rest of, of our, our communities. Uh, I know I put uh, solar panels up uh, about two years ago and now there's three other houses on the block that they put solar panels up too. And so I, I think we have a, a role in uh, leading by example. Um, I live in Montana and, and uh, yet I try to commute on my bike even down to some reasonably serious temperatures because uh, people notice there's Dr. Running uh, riding his bike even though it's snowing. And so I think there's something to say for, for us leading by example. Um, as I've tried to parse the political environment uh, uh, of our country on this topic, and I've been giving public talks about the same length of time, about a decade now, uh, one uh, source I would recommend to any of you uh, is uh, a, a group that puts out these uh, reports called Global Warming Six Americas. And it comes out of, I think, Yale and George Mason University. And they do uh, polling about every six months of attitudes of the American public. And it's really been revealing to me, uh, particularly why this, uh, about a third of the American public, our science just isn't making any headway on. And a um, couple of things become clear. First, we forget how many people get their paycheck from the fossil fuel industry. And those people right away are compromised. Just think about it. And so you, you, can, you can understand that. Uh, and I'm not sure what we'll do with uh, uh, convincing them uh, of, of these issues. Uh, there's, there's also a, uh, a conservative religious uh, segment that doesn't believe in evolution, and they don't believe in climate change either, and they actually discount an awful lot of science, and I don't know what I can do to tell them anything that's going to matter. And so uh, uh, one of the things I find being on a university campus is that my best audiences are the students, because they haven't grown up with the prejudices that my generation has built in now with the lifestyles baked in that uh, my generation has. And, and what I've found, they just can't wait when I tell them, you know what, you have to turn society completely upside down in the, in, during your careers. 
they think that sounds like great fun. <laughs> Wasn't that what we all were going to do when we were 20 years old? And so it's really empowering to the college students of today if we lay this out uh, first, the, first the bad news and then say the good news is you, every single discipline you work in, there is a climate change component that you can be exceedingly helpful to society on. Not just science, not just engineering, on economics, on international diplomacy, uh, right down the list, philosophy. We need help in every discipline on this topic. And that really becomes inclusive to all of them, no matter what their major is. Yeah, so the guy from Yale is Anthony Lazarowitz. All right. Okay. Yep. Uh, one thing that um, we find, just in terms of receptivity to this kind of work, uh, we actually do post-publication surveys of our members, of the people who receive the magazine. And over the last 10 years, the environmental stories that we have published are the um, second most popular category of story amongst our readers, amongst all categories. The only one ahead is natural history, ahead of science, ahead of anthropology and archaeology. People thirst for this kind of thing. And to come back to the Lazarowitz work, there is a group of people who will never accept this idea. There is also an equally large group who are angry that we are not more forceful in these statements. And then there is a vast middle. That is who we are trying to reach. People want to understand how the world works. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to explain. We're not trying to prescribe. But what we're trying to do is actually help people understand how all this works so that they can make their own decisions themselves. And there's a paucity of this kind of back to front explanatory journalism. How about some questions from out here? Yes. Stand up, please. Could you just stand? Yeah. Other question? Oh. I, would, yeah, I would like to say something to you, and I think that it's important that I'm acutely aware of the reliance of the state of West Virginia on coal for, for its economic activity. One thing, I would, one thing I would point out, though, is not all coal is equal. And the coal that comes from West Virginia, I showed a picture of coal trains loaded with coal. The coal that comes from West Virginia it is rarely used now to generate electricity. Most of it now is high, it's higher quality coal and it's used in metallurgy and it's used in steel making. And it's a, it's a pr different kind of coal than the low sulfur coal coming out of Wyoming. Power plants in the state of West Virginia import coal from Wyoming to generate electricity while coal is exported for the steel business worldwide. So not all coal is equal. And there is a benefit to the coal that's coming from West Virginia. Did we give the microphone to some yes. questioner? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Community Sustainability. And my name is Jelili. Uh, I'd like to know if we should focus our energy on the need to create alternative sources of livelihood for those whose sources of income and livelihood depend 
on the issues to consider not sustainable for the planet. Uh, because when I look back home in Africa, where I come from, I think where I struggle to communicate to people is because I don't have alternatives to give to them. And I do think sometimes if I have alternative sources of livelihood to give to them, probably my message will sink down the way I set my message. Because they will tell me, what do you want us to do? You are telling us this is not good. We need to change our ways of life. Are you ready to give us alternative sources of income, sources of livelihood? So I'd like to hear from you, what are your thoughts about this? Should we concentrate our energy on how to devise alternative sources of livelihood for those who depend on burning energy and uh, in those uh, activities that are making this life uh, not sustainable? Okay, I'll try that. I mean, let's keep in mind that human civilization relied on contemporary sunshine until about 300 years ago. And then we discover, discovered coal and oil. We're smart. We're ingenious. Uh, we're clever. Uh, we understand what happened when we discovered fossil sunshine sitting in the ground. Uh, the question is really how can we uh, recapture the power of contemporary sunshine to power the planet? As long as you rely on fossil energy, what you are really doing is a relying on a, that, that, that is a limited supply. And it will get you through decades. Uh, but coal and oil only formed over so many years in the history of the Earth. And if we're burning a million years worth of formation every year, that's supply limited. As long as the sun shines, it's not. It's only bandwidth constrained. We have, we're smart. Figuring out how to take advantage of the bandwidth. Look what happened with Moore's Law. Look what happened with computers. Look at what happened. It is possible if we put our mind to it. And um, for example, in Benin, uh, Jennifer Burney, who was a graduate student at, um, uh, she was at uh, Brooks. She was involved in a project to install solar-powered irrigation in villages in Benin. Villages that had no power, had no infrastructure, and it was a project that she was involved in over two years in collaboration with the Solar Electric Light Fund. They didn't put in diesel generators to generate electricity. They weren't polluting. They weren't indebted to the energy suppliers. They were taking energy from the sun that shines. They built an irrigation system that allowed them to double their cropping, increase their income. It's now become part of it, the solar energy has become part of schools. Schools, girls are able to stay in school. Uh, uh, through puberty now, the, the community has a hospital. It is possible to make a change. I, yeah. with, with any big changes, certain uh, economic activities are ended and uh, new ones uh, emerge. And th that's uh, what change means. And, and of course, it, it really is tough on uh, people who live in the industries that, uh, that uh, fall by the wayside. And this happens in all of our technological revolutions. You can just look at, uh, 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 what if you worked in a factory that built the old style televisions? Boy, you're out of business now. Everybody has flat panel LCDs and you're out of luck. What, what is so necessary with those sort of large change and the, and the kind of changes of the magnitude we're talking about is a clear vision and strategic plan forward so that uh, you, you can anticipate some of uh, these changes. You can anticipate that you're going to need to help industries that uh, uh, need to be uh, closed down and uh, 
and start uh, retraining a workforce towards the new industries that are emerging. And, and to me, the biggest tragedy of all right now is that in our um, national capital, we can't have an intelligent adult discussion on this topic. Now that's to me the biggest problem for all. I mean, we've, uh, like the, uh, the Pakala uh, uh, and Sokolow paper of a decade ago, they la laid out all sorts of alternatives that we could be actively working on. And yet we can't even have a Congress have an intelligent discussion on this. To me, that's the real tragedy here. We have time for two, maybe three more questions, depending upon how succinct we are when we ask them. <laughs> Tell us who you are. What's your question? I'm Pam Pontini. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, the other university. <laughs> We're aware. <laughs> um, first, I want to. Um, Thank you all for this very rich uh, dialogue. It's not often you get to take advantage of such a thing. In particular, I really enjoyed the presentation uh, from the National Geographic perspective because uh, I work with the UN and often, often it's hard data thrown at you and somehow everybody's supposed to go home and understand and it doesn't happen. Impressed by the facts and figures. Um, Using that as a backdrop, um, in China, about eight years ago, we managed I, we managed to have the scientific technology to measure China's air pollution over Denver. Denver. I think one of our challenges is being able to understand how we fit in this larger picture. And this is leading up to my question. Uh, the scientific community and the experts, the reward system is such that uh, we need more scientists out there being able to talk to other scientists who are professional experts working in this field but have no idea what's being said. And then somehow we're supposed to translate that to the general public. Um, it, it's so complicated, the complexity is profound. So my question, how do we create the forums and the dialogues that are necessary and to stop using 19th and 20th century approaches and models to communicating, but how do we engage people in the larger world? to meet the challenges of the 21st century, which are dynamic and demand responsive learning systems? Uh, two things. One, it does come back to what I've said earlier about um, educating and informing uh, young people who are now studying to, to take their place in the world. That is one thing. Uh, that matters. Uh, the other part of it is that scientists themselves need to be willing to step out of the tower and speak to the public. The problem that you do face, though, is that uh, there is a learning curve. Uh, the Aldo Leopold Leadership Institute is one such organization that Jane Lubchenco started about 15 years ago to educate scientists to be able to explain their work and its relevance to the general public. Uh, John Foley of the University of Minnesota is one shining example of a graduate of that program who has established the um, the, an institute at the University of Minnesota to communicate these same ideas. Uh, he wrote our lead article for our series on food that we'll publish in May. And also, uh, he just received a Heinz Award from the Heinz Foundation for the work that he, he's been doing to try to communicate these ideas. You know, I think those of us who were connected to all of this, we were, we were um, all saddened at the loss of Steve Schneider, who was a very public scientist, who was willing to take risks and who, who wanted to explain this challenge to the public as a matter of risk management. 
there are risks in standing up and being counted. There are also greater risks in, in not. I was optimistic in uh, assessing how much time we had left for questions. We, we are out of time. Obviously, uh, our presenters are, are here through the rest of the day. Um, I would ask you, though, to uh, join me in thanking uh, them for a wonderful presentation.